thank you very much for uh, coming out on a Friday afternoon. Um, and thank you to Kevin for inviting me to speak and for putting on um, really nice workshops. I'm based in London, Ontario, um, but I have been watching the past sessions um, over the, the video on the internet. So I'm uh, up to speed, if you will, on, on where everybody is. Um, so as Kevin was saying, what I'm going to talk about today is based on research that I've been doing with a colleague, um, Anil Verma, at the University of Toronto. He's at the Centre for Industrial Relations. Um, in my background, though, I'm sort of situated in management departments, um, is in the field of industrial relations more broadly. Um, we've also, a little bit of this work has been collaborative with Larry Bieferman, who runs the um, Pensions and Capital Stewardship Program uh, at a Harvard uh, Law School, and uh, also with a woman named Susan Sace, who's an academic in, uh, in the UK. So there, uh, the work that I'm talking about today has um, data in it from, from those, those three countries. So for Anil and I, our work began initially um, trying to look specifically at the role, the experiences of labor trustees on pension boards, labor representatives on pension boards, as, an, as a newish thing. Um, that it was something that unions were getting into the game of pension trustees, and there was nothing really known about um, how, how those labor trustees were doing. So since that work, we've expanded a little bit more to become more interested in what is going on for the whole board. So not just the labor trustees, but how do we understand the diversity that occurs on pension boards, particularly in terms of the constituent groups that are represented at that board, and how, um, how does that diversity come to dictate how the board makes decisions, what kind of conversations they have, and the sort of ways that people fulfill their role as a pension trustee. So there's a bit of, uh, of that flavor in here as well. So you've already been learning over the past um, two sessions um, that there are many opinions about pension governance and pension investment. Um, there are probably more opinions about labor's role in pension governance and pension investment, and there's certainly not a common and unified um, idea across the labor movement about how, how these issues should be tackled. And that um, adds challenges for labor trustees who are sort of the frontline representative of whatever voice there may or may not be. So when there's not a voice, it becomes even more tricky for individuals to, to try to interpret their role on a, a pretty complicated, in a pretty complicated scenario. Um, so we'll hear, I think, a lot of technical good stuff about fiduciary duty. I'm going to um, sort of ease us in, perhaps, um, and talk less about uh, specific fiduciary duty, but more a kind of more holistic question, which is how do pension trustees um, perceive their role? So we asked pension trustees, what is your role as a pension trustee? And we got a remarkably nuanced set of responses back. Um, and these were questions for labor trustees, employer trustees, and independent trustees. And there, there is a difference um, into how people interpret their role. And I would suggest that how a, an individual interprets their role as a pension trustee has uh, a lot to do with two things. One is the idea of constituency, and one is the idea of expertise. And that's where I'm going to kind of center my remarks today, around, around those two things. So um, questions then around constituency or the group that you represent and expertise are at the heart of how pension trustees identify with and carry out their role and therefore at the heart of how they um, go about interpreting or enacting any sort of fiduciary duty. Um, they're also controversial topics and have been the source of some debate, particularly around expertise and there's sort of this prudence versus professionalism debate, at least in the academic literature, where there's a questioning of lay trustees and their ability to, to, to be a well-functioning pension trustee, whatever that might be. So let's start with the, the area of constituency. Um, and if you sort of interpret fiduciary duty very simplistically, um, it's you know a sense that you're going to act in a, in a diligent and careful way with the money that you're managing for others, right? And there's the idea that you're going to protect the plan, protect the pension plan for the pension plan members, so uh, the plan beneficiaries. So that 
can imply and sort of assumes that there's sort of one way to be a pension trustee and there's one way to carry out fiduciary duty. Um, but I would argue that there's more than one way. So we've seen in the past pension trustees who maybe have not carried out their fiduciary duty terribly well or they interpreted it in a different way to end up with outcomes like contribution holidays, for example, right? Which we see now as kind of a major problem that happened in the pension landscape. Um, we also see situations where uh, now we're hearing more and more that maybe having member representation on things like corporate boards or things like pension boards is important. And that implies to us then that there's something about constituency that matters. There's something about your background and your personal identity or ideology that matters as a trustee in this situation. So maybe then that there are multiple interpretations of this thing called fiduciary duty, fiduciary responsibility, that are going to be different for people with different constituencies. So that means it's important for us to know how people got on the pension board, who put them on the pension board, and why did they put them on the pension board. These become rather critical questions to understand why the people who are the trustees do what they do. So if you think about this, there are a lot of different ways in our Canadian context about how people can get on pension boards. And if you start thinking about similar countries like the US, Australia, or the UK, there are even more ways that people can come to be pension trustees. So I'll give you a little short list. You could have member trustees. So these are members of the plan who sit on the pension board. They could be elected, they could be appointed. You could have unionized member trustees, what I most often refer to as labor trustees. They could be elected, they could be appointed. You could have, uh, and unionized member trustees could be rank and file, or they could be, you know, senior members of the union. It could be the union president, it could be someone who sat on the pensions and benefits committee for a long time. Uh, you could have retired members of the pension plan sitting on the pension board. They could be elected, they could be appointed. Uh, then you have employer representatives on the board who are most often appointed. I've not yet come across a situation where the employers are electing their representatives to the pension board. Um, we might have people who are employer representatives who sit there because of their job title. So you're the VP fi Finance, that means you sit on the pension board. It's part of your day job. Um, there could be ex officio trustees. So these might be members of the state legislature because of their role as an elected official in whatever capacity, they then need to sit on the pension board. Those people could choose to delegate their seat to somebody else and not actually sit on the board themselves. So they tend to choose some sort of financial expert to sit on their board instead. Uh, you could also have that delegation with the employer seats and the, the labor seats or the member seats and that's what we tend to see with the, the teacher's pension plan which people refer to as sort of a professional plan where uh, people have sort of been hired as professionals or experts to take up those seats. Um, and then largely in the, the context of the UK you can have kind of purely independent seats and there are actually firms who uh, are, are firms of independent trustees and they just farm independent trustees out to sit on whatever pension plans need an independent trustee. So a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds are on these pension boards for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different ways. And that makes a very complicated environment when you start trying to think about, well, why does a board make a decision the way it does? Well, it matters who's sitting around the table. You're not going to have all of these people on every single pension board, but you get an idea of, of how complicated it can be. So then it becomes important to think about how did they get there and why did they get there. So this, this topic of constituency matters. Because the questions you start asking after that is, all right then, are those trustees on the board accountable to the process that put them on the board? Should they be accountable to the process that put them on the board? And we don't have answers to these questions. And then what does accountability to your constituent group even mean for these people, whether they're employer representatives or labor representatives or, or independents? Because thinking about a constituent group for a pension trustee, particularly a labor trustee, is very complicated. 
there is no known agenda or universal agenda of what pension plan members would like to see happen with their pension plan other than it be there when they retire. There's, there's no sense among the beneficiaries, really, about the nitty-gritty decision-making that should go on around the pension board table. Um, there's no, uh, and, and if there was, it wouldn't be a universally held opinion, right? And we know that even from seeing the varied opinions towards uh, pensions that occur across the labor movement in general, across um, different unions. So if you think of, of boards that have multi-employer boards, multi-union boards, this gets even more complicated. If you have labor trustees who are representing unions who don't have the same idea of what labor should be doing on a pension plan, yet they're, they kind of need to work together, but they kind of don't, right? So this gets Sometimes. really, really challenging for, for these pension trustees. Uh, you've been hearing about these issues of SRI. There's, there's no real sense, even among people who are, uh, you know, plan beneficiaries, that the pension should be investing in these, in these various ways. Um, it would be unrealistic for people to think and for unions to think that their membership all really, really walks the talk of a union worldview. A lot of people just want the rate of return, thank you very much. So that's complicated for those trustees, and it's complicated because of their, because of their constituency. So even if, let's pretend then, that there is an agenda from the constituents, they do want something, and it's known to the trustees, and it's universal. Well, if then the trustee acts to reflect the needs and desires of their constituent group, well, but then might they not be violating their fiduciary duty? Because now they're not making decisions based on something that the plan needs. Maybe it's what the plan needs, maybe it's not, but maybe it's a little bit too much about what these people think the plan needs. So this is how this idea of having a constituency comes to complicate things. Um, and even among trustees, they embrace and reject their constituent group in different ways. So I'll give you just a few quotations from some of the interviews that I've done with, with trustees to give you a flavor of this. Um, this is a quote from an employer, uh, an employer trustee on a multi-employer plan in Canada. Um, this person says, I can't say that I have any idea what the other employers would wish that I was doing as their representative. So this person's constituent group is a bunch of other employers who are all signatories to this plan, but this person never talks to them about what's going on on the pension plan, even though this person is their representative. Another employer trustee, which is maybe counter to what we would expect, um, said, my role is to look out for the scheme and its members and not to look out for the company's interests, which is not something we would automatically assume that an employer trustee would say. So this person is actively rejecting their day job in a way. They're being antagonistic to their day job and saying, well, in my role as a pension trustee, it's not my job to protect the company that I work for, my employer, and who I represent on this plan. Um, some quotes from labor trustees. One said, uh, talking about her role as a pension trustee, said that she knows that with fiduciary duty, these things ought not to be different. Her interpretation of her role and fiduciary duty, she knows they ought not to be different. But she goes on to say, but I do find myself wearing my labor hat at times, particularly around discussions of benefit reductions. And we'll come back to this, um, this topic a little, a little bit later. Um, another labor trustee I spoke to said, look, fiduciary duty equals union worldview. They're the same. Because on both sides of the equation, we're looking out for the members. So they think that fiduciary duty actually is basically being a good unionist, which is not the typical interpretation of fiduciary duty either. Independent trustees are a little different. They're much more arm's length. Um, they tend to say things like this. I try to think of my approach as how I would deal with it as a shareholder. So this is much more into the traditional interpretation, much more into the sort of maximizing the rate of return. How much can we get in terms of our bang for the buck? Um, and I'm doing this as an individual. And another one says that they will form a queue behind you. This is a a UK pension trustee, um, who says the other trustees often line up behind independent trustees because you are quite often the lead because your world is not conflicted. You are the one that can lead and push. So this independent trustee is acknowledging that the other trustees on the board 
have complex. They have something going on because they've come from other places and that inhibits their ability to make decisions and do things on the pension plan. Okay, so those are examples then of how constituency matters. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking now about the expertise piece and then we can kind of bring it together at the end. Um, so now, uh, the idea of expertise, and it's interesting because in the first panel, um, Fred Hahn came up and said, I'm a pension expert because I'm a unionist. Um, and this is one side of the, of the expertise debate, right? Um, so the question is then, well, what does make a pension expert? What do we mean by that definition of expertise? And do we need pension experts anyway to make sure that we're fulfilling the fiduciary duty or fulfilling the pension promise? I think this is an open question. Um, and there has been some research on this. Uh, so um, Kakabadzi and Kakabadzi wrote a paper in 2005 that was called Prudence versus Professionalism. And they acknowledged, they sort of lightly acknowledged that it might be an advantage to have financial expertise, but they ultimately conclude, and I quote, that being well qualified and financially well versed are not perceived determinants of effective performance for pension fund trustees. They emphasize instead the importance of wider life and work experiences. So they talk about open-mindedness, they talk about willingness to learn, ability to listen and work with others, and knowing how and when to access external and internal expertise. And when we talk to labor trustees, we get a lot of that same flavor. That they say, um, there's something important in having a union worldview. There's something important. And you learn to be politically savvy, you are persuasive, you're a quick learner of complex ideas, you have leadership qualities. These are all things that being active in your union teaches you. And these are all things that are critically important in the social dynamics of being a successful pension trustee. But there's an equally strong movement that says professionalism. We need to have expert trustees. And uh, authors like uh, a guy named Clark from the UK and um, Ambex Shear from uh, the Rotman School of Management here in Toronto have, have suggested that well-intentioned amateurs can actually... <laughs> That's us. <laughs> us, all of us, well-intentioned amateurs can complicate and limit the decision-making of pension plans and they question the abilities then of lay trustees. Clark went so far as to even take a group of his Oxford grad students and run them in a little lab-based experiment against pension trustees, and he concluded that the pension trustees, uh, or the, the grad students, made cons more consistent strategic investment decisions than the pension trustees. We can critique that paper maybe another day, because um, there are some challenges around how complex the world is of an Oxford grad student compared to the pension trustee who is dealing with all of these constituency issues. But in any case, um, others have suggested a little bit more middle of the road. So there's a report written by miners that came out of the UK in 2001 that said, look, it would be unrealistic to have every single pension trustee gain deep expertise. But what we need to have on the board is a collective sense of expertise. So he advocated and he set out a whole series of guidelines that boards engage in a discussion process amongst themselves to ensure that they had on the board the expertise that they needed. But it was more of a, a sum of the parts kind of model. So what does this look like in practice? Essentially, if your board is leaning more towards the representational side, then the challenge of constituency becomes greater. So all trustees, and Kevin made the point about labor trustees leaving their hat at the door, but it's just as true that sometimes employer trustees need to leave their hat at the door. All, trust all trustees are at a greater risk of succumbing to the moral hazard of the conflict of interest that they may or may not carry around. If you're solely focused on um, having a, a representational board. But if you lean too far towards the professional board, you get things happening that, that we've, you've talked about before, say with the teacher's plan, who is you know, buying up these privatized uh, nurseries in the UK, where the idea of fiduciary duty in that case among professionals becomes too narrow, that it doesn't allow for any consideration of the interests of the people of whose money you're dealing with. So in the case of the teachers, say, with the nurseries, um, the, the board can't interpret in that case that fiduciary duty should mean the long-term protection of public education as a means for the long-term stability of teachers having jobs 
as a means to teachers having pensions. Right? That's a, that's a long-term vision. That if I am an expert professional pension trustee with no real connection to teachers, that's out of my scope. Right? That's not going to come up on the table as revenue. So as you uh, and I think someone, Suzanne was talking about agency costs last week. That, that introduces agency costs, where the people on the board have no connection with the, the beneficiaries in any way. They lose that direct connection with the beneficiaries that, that really hold, holds your toes to the fire, or can hold your toes to the fire when you're making these decisions. And if we go back to the labor trustee who was talking about benefit reductions, she went on to say that she actually voted, yes, benefit reductions as a pension trustee, and then as a unionist, as a high-ranking unionist in her union, she had to go back to all these member groups and explain to them why she had made that decision. And that was very, very, very difficult for her to do. And that experience now makes her very careful and thoughtful about all the decisions that are making at the pension board. And that's something you lose if you don't um, if you focus too much on expertise. Um, another challenge with expertise is how it's measured. Um, so earlier I spoke about the kinds of skills that labor trustees think that are important to be on a pension board. Those aren't the skills that are taught in investment courses, right? That's not, that's not what you learn um, when you go out to become a pension trustee. They don't teach that at the, the International Foundation. Um, so there's a, a problem then with how expertise is measured and how people are then valued in terms of their background and how their background is valued. Because the focus is often solely on technical expertise or subject matter expertise. And the result then in practice for people on boards is that the less technically savvy people uh, can very easily be marginalized. And that happens all the time with labor trustees. And research that we've done has found that, that labor trustees are often most active in the administrative side of the plan, because that's what they're used to doing as part of the union. They're used to interacting with the constituents. They're used to managing these things, much less active on the investment side. And what also happens with this focus on expertise is that you get an over-delegation to experts. So to the fund administrators, to the hired advisors and fund managers, uh, the internal pension staff, uh, a lot gets turned over to them. The agendas of a pension board are set by the pension administrator in most cases, in conjunction with the chair of the board. But pension trustees come to the table, they get fed information, they get fed advice, and then they have to vote. And if you're not feeling very technically competent in what you've just heard, the tendency is to just vote. And that becomes a challenge then if we're thinking about how do we get new ideas. I know I'm out of time, I believe, but I'll wrap up. Um, so the other, one more challenge. One more challenge is, is around subcommittees. And I, I see subcommittees as, as quite dangerous on pension boards, again, because of this uh, perception of technical expertise that especially in larger boards, they often have an investment subcommittee, and that's the group that does all the stuff on investments, and then they make a recommendation back to the main board who votes. Well, if you self-select onto the investment board and you're not feeling very technically savvy, or the rest of the board doesn't perceive you as technically savvy, you're not gonna get into that space. You're not gonna be a part of those discussions. So that's, that's a challenge around expertise as well. All right. So the two takeaway messages um, are that fiduciary duty may have a legal meaning. It does have a legal meaning. We'll hear all about it. Um, and trustees are accountable to that legal meaning, definitely. But fiduciary duty is an end, if we think about it as an end. And there are, there are lots of different ways to get to the end, I think, is what we've uh, learned through dis these discussions with different pension trustees. So it's the representation function of the diverse board. It's taking into consideration the constituent groups that allow you to find the alternative ways to achieve whatever fiduciary responsibility you need to achieve. It's having those different voices on the board that allow you to do it like this instead of doing it like this, or vice versa. And an example of that is uh, we asked pension trustees, what are the areas of conflict? What do you fight about on the board? And they all say, we don't fight about anything. We, it's all consensus-based. Um, they're very concerned with having conflict, too concerned. 
Um, but one of the things that they did say was, well, we do have debate often when we have to talk about increasing contributions because of solvency issues, which makes sense. Um, so in that example, an expert would say, raise the contributions, right? Your gap is this much, therefore raise contributions by this much. Go, done. But in speaking to labor trustees, and more than one labor trustee said this, they said, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a bit of a shock, right? Do we have to do that as a cliff? Do we have to raise the contribution by X amount tomorrow? Or can we phase it in? Can we phase it in over the next six months, or the next three months, or over the next year? We still get to the same end, but we get to it in a way that doesn't shock the, the Jesus out of our constituents. We give a chance though, for those, those people to, to ease into the new contribution rate. But that's not something that would have come to the table if those people weren't at the board and didn't have that direct connection to those beneficiaries. So that's an idea, that there is some value and merit to the connection and understanding of where the plant members are coming, coming from. And that's a nice story, and it would be a really nice place to end. But I do want to try remotely to answer some of the questions that Kevin set out. Um, and one is around this idea of, is fiduciary duty then a, ch a chain to doing things differently? Um, and I do have to acknowledge that most trustees, union and otherwise, succumb very readily and very strongly to fiduciary duty as king. I need to maximize the rate of return. You cannot talk to me about anything else because I'm going to get sued. That's a very persuasive argument, particularly when you're talking about people who don't feel incredibly technically competent because they don't have a whole lot of support from their unions, they don't have a whole lot of training, they don't have a whole lot of networks, they don't have a very good argument against a very strong <coughs> argument. And that's a real challenge. So, you know, any one trustee is not going to have the political power on a board to be, to be changing the thinking without a whole lot more investment into what that argument is supposed to look like. And I will leave it there. Thanks very much. Very good.